today on Grace to You. We have a society that assaults any kind of dogmatism, any kind of clarity, any kind of strong conviction, any kind of absolute truth. But biblical truth is not relative. It is absolute. It is sharp. It is black and white. So when you begin to preach absolute truth to this post-truth culture, they are highly offended. And if pragmatism is your driving philosophy, you're going to get rid of the things that offend them. And so that's going to water down doctrine. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, I was asked to talk about discernment, and it's a big subject and have a lot to say, so I'm very interested to hear exactly what I'm going to say. Um, that's part of the adventure of preaching. But I would ask you to open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's just approach it in a rather simple, straightforward way. At the end of uh, this wonderful letter to the Thessalonian church, a, th a church basically that was doing really well, uh, no particular issue or sin is raised in this epistle, but there were some very basic um, instructions to give to them. Um, verse 12 and 13, appreciate your leaders, esteem them highly in love, live in peace with one another, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Don't repay evil for evil. Seek what is good for one another, for all people. This is wonderful, basic, practical instruction for the church. Very pithy. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Then it gets a little more serious. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil." And on that basis, he can pronounce a kind of benediction. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely. I just want us to glance at verses 20 to 22. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This is the, the last and the, sort of the climax of simple directives, simple commands that we read. This is basically commands to a healthy church. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Despise means make light of, belittle, treat as insignificant, downgrade. Prophetic utterances is the Greek word propheteos. That just means preaching. Propheteos means to stand before someone and speak. The gift of interpreting and proclaiming the divine will. Pro pro proclamation of the Word of God. Don't downgrade preaching. Now, that would be a sermon in itself to this generation. Don't downgrade preaching, but examine everything carefully. Dakimadzo means to test to validate, to prove. It is essentially what God does. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, God ultimately is going to validate or invalidate the record of anyone's life as to its motives. The process, to borrow Paul's words to the Ephesians, is an effort to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And what is pleasing to the Lord is an accurate interpretation of His Word, right? Cut it straight, get it right. 
We must be able to distinguish, to judge, examine everything, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to whatever conforms to a true interpretation of Scripture. Hold fast to what is good. This is not just talking about behavior. This is talking about truth. This is talking about teaching, instruction, preaching. Hold fast to what is good. Sounds a lot like Romans 12, 9. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. There is the foundational assumption about truth. Some things are true and some things are not. And you have to be able to distinguish the difference so that you can hold to what is true and you can abstain from what is not. Hold fast means take possession of it, embrace it wholeheartedly. Whatever is kalas, inherently good, not, not good on the surface, not good-looking, but inherently good, as kakas is inherently evil, kalas is inherently good. What is genuinely true and noble and righteous? Now you're at the end of 1 Thessalonians. Look over at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, and hear these words, "'So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us." The Apostle Paul is saying, hold on to apostolic teaching because the Apostle's doctrine was revealed from heaven. There's no room for reckless faith. There's no room for gullibility, believing anything that comes down the pike. You have to have the discerning power to sort out what is inherently good and true from what is evil. Now, the backside of that, verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. And not evil necessarily as a behavior, but evil as an idea. To abstain means to hold yourself away from, to shun. In fact, it's used um, back in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Abstain means completely shun that, and that's the very same verb here. When you find any scheme, any form of doctrine, any teaching that is evil because it isn't true, you turn away from it. Complete separation of the believer from any teaching, any instruction that is not true true. Listen, if we are anything as Christians, we are essentially the people of the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of what? The truth. The truth. It was the Lutheran commentator Linsky who I think died about three years before I was born, but through the years I've read his material, who said this, the worst form of wickedness consists of perversions of the truth. The worst form of wickedness consists of perversions of the truth. Although, he said, many look upon these perversions with indifference and regard them as harmless. This passage doesn't let you do that. Any perversion of the truth is evil. Anything evil is poisonous, destructive, damaging. So abstain from every form. Idos. Idos is like the word idol. Idos is any shape, any appearance, any sort, any species, any category. So as believers, this is foundational to our Christian life. We must discern what is evil and what is good, what is false and what is true. This is a direct call for exercising spiritual critical powers. The lack of discernment in the church today shows up in so many, many, many ways. So how did we get to this point? Let me digress a little bit from our text just maybe to give you a little insight into that. 
just looking at it, I think there are some identifiable causes that uh, started out as trends and have now become norms. I'll give you a handful. Number one, th this is the product of the weakening of doctrinal clarity and conviction. That ought to be obvious to everybody. Discernment can't exist where there's really indifference toward doctrinal clarity and conviction. And, and why did doctrinal clarity and conviction begin to die out as an interest in evangelicalism? Because pragmatism took over. And doctrinal clarity and strong conviction gets in the way of pragmatism gets in the way of marketing strategy, political correctness. And so I suppose the unintended consequences are that you literally validate the unbeliever's resentment of the gospel by removing the part that he resents. And then if you try to reintroduce precision in doctrine, clarity in doctrine, he feels that this is a bait and switch. And living in a post-truth world, the, I think, single greatest assault has to be on religion or philosophy. People believe in truth in the physical world, right? Because they can see it, they live it every day. It's a lot easier to believe there's no absolute truth in the spiritual world, the religious world. So in a post-truth world, about the only place these people can go uh, to, to really accomplish their purposes is into the world of people's ideas and beliefs. So you have a society that assaults any kind of dogmatism, any kind of clarity, any kind of strong conviction, any kind of absolute truth. So it receives the brunt of the world's attacks. I don't see any attack on architecture or engineering. I don't see any attack on obvious, evident physical realities. Religion, being the most subjective relative of all things, is simply identified as some kind of an anti-intellectual, irrational, emotional, experiential world that is not supposed to be rational, it's not supposed to be propositional truth, so it's fair game. So in a post-truth world, most of the assaults are going to come on what we think, on ideas, and religion, of course, is in the realm of ideas. So when you begin to preach absolute truth to this post-truth culture, they are highly offended. And if pragmatism is your driving philosophy, you're going to get rid of the things that offend them. And so that's going to water down doctrine. So the first thing I see leading to this lack of discernment is the weakening of doctrinal clarity and conviction. Secondly, and I think this is how we have to think. This culture is, is unwilling to think antithetically. This culture is unwilling to think antithetically about religion. That is, they don't think in black and white. They, they, they think on a sort of spectrum of uh, relativity. This means that everything continues along a line of relative shades of gray. There's no right, there's no wrong, there's no true, there's no false. Everything is subjective. But biblical truth is not relative, it is absolute, it is sharp, it is black and white, it is antithetical to all that is lies, deception, and error. Some years ago, Jay Adams wrote a book called Call for Discernment. In that book, he wrote this, antithesis is dulled more and more as people attempt to integrate, run from that word, when the Bible separates. The 
Key task, says Adams, is to distinguish God's ways from all other ways. Whereas in this world, people are looking for agreement. How can we merge the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of God from the perspective that will draw in a sinner? Discernment thrives when there's a thesis, antithesis, black and white, antithetical mentality. Third reason that I think uh, we have the problems we have with discernment, and they're all overlapping, is a preoccupation with image and influence as a key to evangelism. I mean, we've all seen the user-friendly approach come and go. We, we've, we've, we've got to create an image if we're going to reach the non-believers. We've got to be popular. We've got to be acceptable. Carl Henry is quoted in um, Martin Lloyd-Jones' biography by my friend Ian Murray. He said, if you look at the early years of the Billy Graham organization, you'll find that its overall policy was to attain prestige and influence for evangelicals. To do this, there had to be a successful image, and that would not be possible, they believed, unless every effort was made to avoid any division with those who didn't believe the Bible. That's Carl Henry. The Graham organization, goes on, wrote, Henry was not ready to forfeit, this is a quote, forfeit dialogue with the ecumenical leaders and churches because it feared a loss of influence. Apologetics professor at the time, E.J. Carnell at Fuller, said, we need prestige desperately. This has been around a long time. We're going back into the 1950s. If you're trying to find prestige in the culture, you're going to lose the will to discern and discriminate. The church has lost her will to disturb the world, to disturb the sinner, to upset the sinner, to terrify the sinner. So the cause? Lack of conviction, failure to be antithetical, preoccupation with worldly image. Uh, a fourth, just shortening these a little bit, the reason why we have a lack of discernment is a failure to properly interpret Scripture. Interpreting Scripture is not easy. It's possible, but it takes some work. Um, the trend more recently is the megachurch pastors are self-appointed, untrained, unskilled handlers of Scripture. They're, they're sort of like a churchy quiz show host. This is no place for fools. This is no place for theater. This is a place for gifted men who rightly handle the Word of Truth to stand and proclaim, thus says the Lord. And there are rules. There's a science of hermeneutics. There's a science of interpreting the Bible. It's not willy-nilly. It's not a free-for-all. If you look for a minute at Second Timothy, the familiar words of this passage, chapter 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed accurately handling the Word of Truth. There's a right way to handle Scripture and any other way is a wrong way. God didn't mean anything you want Him to mean. He meant exactly what He intended to say. When somebody raises this issue, what does this verse mean to you? It's like running fingernails down a blackboard to me. My response is, what does this verse mean if you never existed? This has nothing to do with you or what you think. What does this verse mean to you? Who cares? That is not the question. 
The question is, what does God intend to say? And I believe that is available. And I can promise you it can be done. And you know when you hear it, don't you? You know when you hear it. This is so critical. Why? Second Timothy 2, because there's so much worldly empty chatter. Verse 16, it leads to further ungodliness and talk that pr- spreads like gangrene from people like Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth. That's all over the place, people straying from the truth and misleading others. So be diligent to be approved by God. I, I, there's really only one audience who concerns me, and it's, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. There's a fifth reason why there's a lack of discernment and there's so much false teaching in the church, and that is the failure to discipline error. The first instruction the Lord ever gave to the church, Matthew 18, first instruction, this is the church. If someone's in sin, go to them. If they don't repent, go back with two or three witnesses. If they don't repent, tell the whole church. If they don't repent, put them out. That's church discipline. Now look, the, the worst perversion in the church is false teaching. But there's, there's very little, if any, will to discipline anyone in churches today. That's not the way to grow a church. I get it. You know, people in Jerusalem said, don't join that place. People die at the offering. (laughs) That isn't the issue. The issue is the Lord says He wants a pure bride, wants a pure church. The realization, the reality, and even the threat of confrontation of sin and false doctrine in the church is essential to keep it out of the church. But there's no real interest in discipline, even though the Lord is explicit about that. I would suggest also that another reason for lack of discernment is spiritual immaturity. There's just a lack of robust biblical doctrine being taught in churches. So you have a lot of baby Christians who are children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. They don't have the powers to discern. They don't have what Hebrews 5 talks about, having their senses exercised to grow up. So those are some of the things that you would recognize that have contributed to this. But I remind you that Proverbs 14.33 says, wisdom resides in the heart of the discerning. Proverbs 16.21, the wise in heart are called discerning. Proverbs 17.24, discerning man keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. That is why, going back to our text, this command in chapter 5 is so simple. Do not downgrade preaching, but examine everything carefully. Embrace what is good, shun every kind of evil. Spiritual discernment is the ability to distinguish God from Satan, sound doctrine from perversion. So how do I become a discerning person? Well, you know the answer, right? I think it starts with a desire. Proverbs chapter 2, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. I love this, verse 3, cry for discernment. Is that part of your prayer life? Cry for discernment. 
Lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord. You want discernment? Cry for that discernment. Treasure the commandments within you. Incline your heart to understanding. Search for the hidden treasures. Discover the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, perhaps a pan for gold. But verse 12, where can wisdom be found? They could do all of that, but they wouldn't find wisdom. Isn't that what James said, if any man lack wisdom? What's the next line? Let him ask of God. You want to be a discerning person? Pray to be a discerning person. Pray for discernment. And then submit to Scripture because that's the wisdom from above. Follow discerning teachers. Follow discerning teachers. They will teach you discernment. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, the, the things that I have taught you, follow those things. Depend on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the anointing you have from God that teaches you all things. You are the hope of the world because you can discern the truth. Be bold to proclaim it. Father, thank You for our time together today, tonight, throughout the week. Thank You for giving us a little taste of heaven, the fellowship of the saints which we will enjoy forever in Your presence. Bless every precious soul here. And with grateful hearts, we express our deep gratitude for loving us, for redeeming us, for keeping us unto eternal glory. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Discernment is critical in every area of life. We are constantly lied to, misled, or simply misinformed. Nowhere is discernment more important than in our relationship with Christ and His Word. Thankfully for the believer, Christ gives us the Holy Spirit to help us in understanding truth and discerning fact from fiction. In Pastor John's book, Standing Strong, he examines what Scripture says about spiritual warfare and how to resist the enemy of your soul. To order a copy, give us a call at 888-57-GRACE or visit our website, gty.org. This resource is great for personal study or with friends in a small Bible study as it comes with a study guide located in the back of the book. As always, thank you for joining us today. We are so thankful for those of you who share our commitment to stand strong for the truth, one verse at a time.